It's a fifty-six dollars more at every month. It's a good money to go buy some extra food or shoes or clothes. We do, we do not have the resources. We don't have we do not have the information. Two different views of a major pay bump in San Diego, the city workers who are scrambling to support and enforce the new law. You assume a lot when you move out here. You may have gained some peace and quiet and beautiful hills and all of that, but you've, you've taken on some responsibilities. East County communities rebuilding after the border fire, the tensions that remain after a grim discovery, and the lessons learned for the next firefight. We're not talking about star-crossed lovers. Watch the rise and fall of a Shakespeare power couple in San Diego. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma. Authorities are looking into the deaths of two people found after the border fire near Potrero. KPBS reporter Taryn Mento says while the fire is 100 percent contained, the community is beginning to prepare for the next one. I thought everything was just going to be gone. For Leland Minard, the border fire was a grueling several days of not knowing whether his business in Potrero, an auto repair shop, would survive. Because of roadblocks and evacuations, the Alpine resident was forced to watch the fire's progress from afar. And every once in a while you see all the smoke, and every once in a while you see like a big black plume of smoke just come out of nowhere, and I was like, that's probably the shop right there. But it wasn't the shop. Minard's business survived, as did about 200 other properties that were threatened during the 7,600-acre border fire. In messages posted around town, the community thanked the firefighters for keeping damage to a minimum. Eleven outbuildings and five homes were destroyed. But two people lost their lives, and the deaths created tension between residents and law enforcement after neighbors of the two people killed claim authorities were slow to search for the missing couple. As county officials work with the community to repair relations, recovery efforts move forward. The Red Cross has opened 86 cases to help residents get back on their feet, from rebuilding homes to aiding those who lost lost food due to power outages. For Potrero Tecate Fire Safe Council leader Bob Buer, he's looking beyond rebuilding. The former volunteer firefighter wants to prepare the largely independent community for the next fire. You assume a lot when you move out here. You may have gained some peace and quiet and beautiful hills and all of that, but you've You've taken on some responsibilities. Buer says many people in the area may choose not to evacuate during a fire, so he's working on plans that will respect their desires to protect their property, but also keep them safe. We've already got a commitment from one property owner that lives way up in the back end of uh, Patrol Valley. And she's got, I don't know, a field that's like a thousand acres and the grass is like three inches tall. So we can put a hundred people out there, hundred cars out there and they'll be safe, you know. Uh, and as soon as the fire burns by, they can come right back home. In an area like Potrero, the rough, dry terrain means wildfires are a constant threat. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. President Obama pressed Congress today to break the deadlock on funding for the fight against the Zika virus that can lead to birth defects. Senate Democrats stopped a Republican plan because it was less than Obama had requested and it came with strings. The problem is right now that that money is stuck in Congress and uh, we have not seen uh, the House and the Senate come together in a sensible way to put forward the dollars that we have requested that have been budgeted to get the job done. The president says a vaccine offering protection from the Zika virus could be made in fairly short order if Congress acts on the funding. He says he expects Congress to do that before they leave for summer recess. Starting today, parents need to make sure their kids are vaccinated before heading back to school. The new law stops schools from admitting students unless they have their shots. Families could also skip vaccines if they have a valid medical excuse. The controversial law eliminated religious and personal belief exemptions from child vaccinations. 
An attempt to cap the salaries of hospital executives in California has been withdrawn. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg says the measure would have limited executive pay to $450,000 a year. SEIU United Healthcare Workers West said it had turned in enough signatures to qualify the measure for the fall ballot. But an arbitrator ruled the measure violated an agreement the group had with the California Hospital Association. Union spokesman Steve Trossman maintains capping executive salaries makes sense. We believe that people who run a, a hospital should make a decent salary, but we don't believe it's reasonable for a hospital executive to make three or four or five million dollars a year when they're essentially running a charity. The Hospital Association argued limiting executive pay would have prompted top administrators to move out of California. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. The White House said today that drone and other U.S. military strikes have killed up to 116 civilians in Pakistan, Yemen and Africa since President Obama took office in 2009. Today's disclosure was the first time the government has released figures on civilian casualties in such operations, but human rights advocates contend the number is a lot higher. California's strict gun laws just got tighter. Governor Jerry Brown signed six bills today that require people to turn in high-capacity magazines and demand background checks for ammunition sales. But he also vetoed five other gun control measures. Some are duplicates of what will appear in Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom's gun control initiative on the November ballot. One gun control opponent said the state's new gun laws mean independence, freedom and liberty in California have been chopped at the knees and kicked between the legs. San Diegans voted to raise the city's minimum wage to $10.50 an hour beginning this month. Another bump will come in January to $11.50 an hour. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser says with only one month to figure out how to enforce the higher wages, the city is scrambling. It's just before the lunchtime rush, and Juan Pablo Sanchez is checking in with one of his 12 employees. His family has owned the City Heights restaurant Super Cocina for 27 years. In just a few weeks, Sanchez has to be ready for a big change, the city's minimum wage increase. He isn't sure what to do to follow the law. We need to know what's going to happen so, so we can self-enforce it, so we can apply. We, don't, we do not have the resources. We don't have, we do not have the information. We don't have the contact to be able to really know how to apply the law. He doesn't even know what date the new law goes into effect. I have to call in to my, to my paychecks or to my pay, pay, pay company and they don't know the law so I, I have to be able to explain to them how it's going to accrue and so, uh, yeah, and even my workers don't know, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling them that their wages are going to increase. Super Cocina employees start at minimum wage and then their pay rises after six months. They also get a week of paid vacation, but the new city law requires five paid sick days. So Sanchez is figuring that out as well. So far, he isn't getting any direction from the city. That's because the new law was only passed by voters a month ago, so city staff haven't had time to get the word out. And city leaders haven't decided how to enforce it. When the city council voted to raise the minimum wage two years ago, the first increase wasn't scheduled for six months. But then business groups blocked the increase with a referendum. So now the city has less than a month to get a system into place to enforce the law before the increase takes effect. And when do we want to send it to Council Mayor Asaf? The San Diego nonprofit Center on Policy Initiatives is working to make sure the wage hike is enforced. Its director, Claire Crawford, wants the city to take several steps. Making sure that information is available in multiple languages. Um, there are both employees and employers whose primary language is not English. Also finding employers who don't raise wages. Making sure when, when you have repeat offenders that the penalties are serious. Another major problem for a lot of employees is retaliation. So she hopes the city will have a strong penalty for that. The city council will vote on several ways to enforce the new law this month, including fines of up to $3,000 for retaliation and putting up posters to tell employees about the new law. One question is whether the city will proactively look for lawbreakers or wait for complaints. Complaint-driven gets you so far, or if the city's aware of it, they can go and actually take a proactive approach to investigating if they're hearing that something is going on. I'm working McDonald's. Okay. And Wendy's when I started on 2001.
Roselva Gomez now works at Burger King and has been there for two and a half years. She still earns minimum wage and is eager for the 50 cent raise coming in the next few weeks. It's a $56 more at every month. It's a good money to go buy some extra food or shoes or clothes. Gomez has three teenage sons who always seem to be hungry. Her husband fell off a roof on the job three years ago and now can't work. She says some of her co-workers don't know about their coming raises. She wants to report employers who aren't following the rules. But even now, when she's asked to work through her breaks, she doesn't know who to tell. It's not good, you know. We work hard and then we, I think we need, we, um, we need respect. Back at Super Cocina in City Heights, the employees are cooking pan after pan of enchiladas, soups and mole. The owner Sanchez says he supports raising salaries, but feels businesses like his are left out of policy decisions. We want to be able to comply and do everything right. And sometimes like, you know, the fact that we haven't had any information, that we're not being supported, feel, feel, makes us feel more left out. The city has $400,000 in this year's budget to enforce the new law. That will have to cover printing notices in multiple languages, setting up a complaint line, and hiring staff to be sure wages in San Diego do rise on schedule. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Video journalist Chris Arciaga helped produce that story. San Diego's minimum wage will keep rising over the next six years. That's thanks to a state law that gradually increases the minimum wage to $15 an hour. The old Mira Mesa Senior Center is looking a bit more youthful today. San Diego officials have inaugurated the newly revamped Vern Goodwin Senior Center. Improvements to the nearly 3,700 square foot facility include a new roof and air conditioning. Officials say it took more than 20 years for the center to get any upgrades. Unfortunately, we haven't been doing a good, very good job of keeping up with the maintenance here at the senior center. It wasn't air conditioned, even though it's a cool zone. So we want to make sure that, especially during this time of summer, that our seniors who enjoy this facility every single day have a safe place to go to. They have a new center, new air conditioning, brand new coat of paint, and they're really excited about the way this turned out. And it's just a, a great example of what we're doing as a community to come together and lift up Mira Mesa. <laughs> Kate also says the city allocated about $361,000 toward the upgrades. The message from San Diego police and lifeguards on this 4th of July holiday, keep it clean and family friendly. You will see more officers and lifeguards over the weekend. They plan on keeping the peace with the big crowds who are expected to take over San Diego beaches. With so many people in a, in a smaller area, you're going to have conflict, whether it's over a parking place, whether it's over a place at the beach, there's a lot of opportunity for that type of conflict. And so those things uh, can get out of hand, and that's what we're here for. In addition to stopping bad behavior by the water, authorities are also cracking down on enclosed tents. They say too many illegal things can happen inside those tents. Also, the tents are technically against the law. The half dome tents are great, pop up tents are great. We understand everyone needs shade and those are fine, but the fully enclosed camping tents are off limits. Steph Davis says we can expect a red, white, and beach day this 4th of July with sunny skies across San Diego. She has the forecast in tonight's KPBS weather report. Happy Friday, everyone, and the weather across our area looking good as we head towards our Independence Day holiday weekend. Satellite and radar showing monsoonal moisture continuing to bring an active weather pattern across the four corners. Nothing atypical of this time of year. So if you're heading east for the holidays, do watch for showers and thunderstorms. Though if you're sticking around the Golden State looking good to go with mostly dry conditions. Taking a look at our satellite and radar across the San Diego area, not a whole whole lot going on here. You'll notice dry conditions across the region and that's the way we will stay as we head into our Friday night. So Friday night plans should go off without a hitch in Borrego Springs. Dry and mild, low temperature 71 degrees. Back to the low 50s we go in Mount Laguna. 56 Ramona, 55 Alpine with just a few patchy clouds. Dry and 64 tonight in Oceanside and a quiet Friday night weather-wise in San Diego. Your low temperature is 64 degrees.
Similar pattern as we look ahead to our Saturday, seasonable for this time of year. Uptick in monsoonal moisture, bringing showers and thunderstorms to the four corners. However, California and Nevada should remain largely dry and fairly seasonable as we roll throughout our Saturday. Here's a look at your five day outlook for the coast. Low clouds breaking for sunshine Saturday and Sunday with daytime highs in the mid 70s. If you're heading out and about for your Independence Day Monday, weather looking good, we will remain dry with highs in the low 70s. Partly cloudy on Tuesday and then lots of sunshine at the coast on Wednesday. Nice with your high at 73. Five day outlook inland showing a similar pattern here. Tranquil over the next five days with clouds breaking for sunshine Saturday and Sunday. Fourth of July Monday looks good. Low clouds breaking for sun with highs in the mid 70s will remain in the mid 70s Tuesday and into your Wednesday inland. If you're getting away for the long weekend, here's your five day outlook across the mountains. Sunny and humid on Saturday, highs in the upper 70s. Mostly sunny and nice Sunday, high 80 degrees. For your July 4th Monday, mostly sunny and 85. And similar conditions will extend Tuesday and into your Wednesday in the mountains. Wrapping things up with their five day outlook for the desert, mostly sunny sunny sky Saturday and Sunday with triple digit daytime highs going to be very warm for your Independence Day Monday. So keep yourself nice and hydrated. Don't forget the sunscreen high temperature 107 sunny and very warm on Tuesday and plenty of bright sun on Wednesday with your high at 104. Steph Davis KPBS News. Shark researchers are sinking their teeth into the unknown. They are testing a one-of-a-kind camera to mount on great white sharks. They want to know why the fish travel each year to a spot in the Pacific Ocean nicknamed the White Shark Cafe. This is about halfway between Mexico and Hawaii. Scientists hope to get the camera working by winter. Some Sherman Heights residents say they're not happy with the city of San Diego's solution to a homeless encampment in their area. It was an installation of sharp rocks beneath an underpass. The residents are proposing something different. KPBS video journalist Katie Shulev has more. The Interstate 5 underpass along Imperial Avenue is a popular route for Sherman Heights residents to walk downtown. Before the city installed jagged rocks back in April, some say it was too crowded with homeless people and too dangerous for pedestrians. Women have been assaulted there. Uh, I understand one child was punched. Um, when families are walking by there, there's feces, there's human waste there, there's urine, there's trash. Devana Almagro is executive director of the Sherman Heights Community Center. She says when residents brought their concerns to the mayor, they were told the city was going to install a rock garden. The actual installation, $57,000 spent on hundreds of jagged rocks in cement, was a big disappointment to her. Believe me, I think that if the mayor or the city would have approached the residents um, about what can we do about that, uh, about activating that site, what would you like to see? I think the jagged rock garden would have been the last thing on our list. And last month, the Voice of San Diego obtained emails showing the rocks are part of a larger effort to clean up the thoroughfare to Petco Park before the July 12th All-Star Game. Now, some say the rocks have simply created other issues. Uh, I live at 25th and Commercial, and uh, most of those neighborhoods have alleys in between the back, and we are just having a lot more homeless people sleeping in the alleys behind our homes. And it's uh, dangerous. People have hurt themselves on the rocks. I got bruises here, bruises there. These is pointy. This is sharp. All this stuff here is sharp. They pin everybody's life in danger, you know what I mean? If per, uh, a disabled person come down here and fall and hit their head on there, they in trouble, you know what I mean? The city wouldn't give an interview for this story, but gave us this statement, which reads, in part, Everyone deserves to feel safe walking down the sidewalk, and the dark underpass and narrow streetscape on Imperial Avenue posed public safety risks for visitors and residents alike. The city believes Imperial Avenue is now safer. One thing I was going to ask you. Almagro and Sherman Heights residents have asked Mayor Kevin Faulkner to replace the rocks with a more beautiful alternative, such as a mural or LED light installation. She says he was receptive and open to suggestions for a potential replacement to the rocks. When I think government and residents, you know, work together, you know, beautiful things can happen. And we have ideas of what we want. We don't only have issues. We actually have solutions. Katie Shulev, KPBS News. 
Check out this Legoland masterpiece that is tall enough for the Big Apple. Carlsbad police and firefighters unveiled the 26-foot-tall replica of the One World Trade Center yesterday. It is, of course, made of Legos, 250,000 of them. It's the tallest Lego model in the country, and it's part of Legoland's Miniland New York attraction. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Why Polish immigrants in England are fearing for their safety in the wake of Brexit. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Shakespeare has given us many loving couples, from Romeo and Juliet to Benedict and Beatrice. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando says a new Globe production asks us to consider the Macbeths in that group. The Macbeths might be the most misunderstood couple in Shakespeare. When the play opens, their marriage seems intimate, with Macbeth immediately sharing good news with his wife. Who all hailed me, Thane of Cordial, by which title before, these, these weird sisters, sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on a time with Hail King. They seem the happiest of couples. I think so anyway, certainly the couples that I've I've encountered, I mean, Benedict and Beatrice end up uh, uh, pretty jolly, but you could imagine them having some feisty <laughs> dinner table arguments. But I think the play proceeds from a basis of love, from an intense joy at their own partnership and the possibilities of it and their complete alliance. Think of them as the ultimate power couple. They're an amazing couple. They're uh, very special. And they are a team where one human being might have a limit. The other person can step in and help that human being. And you shall leave this night's great business into my respect. Actress Martha Stephanie Blake says interpretations of Lady Macbeth as evil or witch-like are all wrong. In the very first scene, the one that everyone knows when she calls the spirits, it's come. Spirits, spirits attend on mortal thoughts. Unsets me here. And fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. A person who is naturally evil doesn't need to call evil spirits to help her do something bad. I feel like she is literally galvanizing herself. She's having to get herself ready for this act. When Lady Macbeth does her invocation, I always feel that she needs to do that because that's not her natural disposition. Her natural disposition is not towards doing terrible deeds. I think she conjures dark forces because she needs them to actually follow through with this, this terrible idea. It's a line where she says, I've given suck and love the babe that milks me. I would while it were smiling my face. I've plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. That again sounds evil, but what she's saying is I would do that. She doesn't say she did or has. She's saying if I had promised you that to Macbeth, if I had promised you that, in the same way we made this promise that we were going to do this thing, I would do it for you. Harold Bloom, he says that the Macbeths are the happiest married couple in all of Shakespeare. And I think it's true until they murder Duncan and it goes south. Bring me along, Bill! Murder and treason! This is the moment where director Brian Kulick decides to bring blood to the forefront in a highly stylized manner that makes us feel steeped in blood without spilling any on stage. I'm a big believer in letting language do the job, and that evoking it is sometimes stronger than actually seeing it. Blood is so extraordinary in this play. It's amazing. It's like having your own private art gallery. It's like you get, with every time you say these lines, you get to see your own private art gallery from a subtly different angle. Blood changes for Lady Macbeth, from it being a trivial thing. A little water clears herself this deed. How easy is it then? To the thing that unhinges her mind. She gets to a point where she can't live with the things they've done. And that says to me that she actually is tortured by all the things that she's done or helped him do. Some of the things she doesn't quite know about, there's a point where he just stops talking to her. And I think one of the great tragedies of the play is it becomes a study in loneliness. You know, he becomes more and more and more isolated and you feel like even with all the terrible things that he does, there's a possibility to stay whole in some way if he, if he continued 
to love his wife or be as, be as closely tied to his wife at the end of the play as he is at the beginning. This production of Macbeth is overtly provocative in modernizing the setting and making the witches patients in a veterans hospital. But perhaps the most daring choice is to ask us to see Macbeth as an intimate marital drama. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. After 42 years, Garrison Keillor is saying goodbye to a prairie home companion. I know a woman named Heather Massey. You want class while she is classy. She can sing straight and she can scat. And she's from Maine, so she knows where it's at. Come on. Some 18,000 fans are gathering at the Hollywood Bowl tonight to help send off the longtime public radio host and his folksy reports from Lake Wobegon. Bluegrass musician Chris Thiele will replace Keeler when the show returns in the fall. KPBS Radio will broadcast his last show this weekend at 6 p.m. on Saturday and 11 a.m. on Sunday. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening. At the airport I'm waiting for a man A man with a foreign object in his hand Perhaps a toothpaste or a soda can And try to place it in my briefcase Some man in turban and a white caftan Someone from Iraq or Iran And I see him behave suspiciously But it could be